could spend an entire year college course, three hour lecture, multiple days per week, going on the topic of music, math, and brain, and barely scratch the surface. There's a lot of amazing information there, and there's a lot of new research coming out every week, every month. There's new papers getting published that are super relevant and super interesting. So my goal today is not to give you a broad overview of all this material. My goal is to dive deep in a few small, specific topics that are relevant to your students, so you can use this in the classroom. I don't want this to just be content for you floating up in your heads. I mentioned this in the last session too, but I've been to a lot of PDs. I know that the most frustrating thing is that most of them are very irrelevant. You leave and you're like, okay, that was nice. It was maybe motivational. There was some good <coughs> info, but I don't know that I can do something different in my classroom tomorrow because of being here. Um, for most of us, the most useful way to use this kind of PD would just be to have the district teachers talking to each other and connecting and talking about the district concert that's coming up or the way your curriculum works or how does scheduling work at your school. Oh, you have a before school band. How did you structure that? You know, those sorts of conversations are often far more useful than the content. So I'm hoping that what I give you today is some useful things you can actually use in your classroom, even just a few minutes of that. But if you don't get any good content, at least hopefully you get some good laughs and some smiles and a good time. We also have some interesting videos that I'll show you that I think will be really fun too. So my goal is to dive uh, deep into a few very small select topics. There's a lot more stuff in the mathematics, music, integration, brain science world that we will not touch. But if you want more info, there's a lot in the handout. There's a bunch of links there. You, there's hundreds of studies you can go and read, tons of great examples, lots of great stuff out there. I'm happy to advise you if you want to pop me an email after. If there's something specific you'd like more info on, we can go deeper there. So why music math in the brain? <coughs> One uh, explanation is, oh, it's like buzzwords, it's fun, it's integration with science, okay, cool, my, my administrator's gonna like that, but the admin tend to like this topic subject, because anytime you say that you're gonna teach something to music teachers that isn't music, it makes them happy, because they like it when you know things that aren't music. But, but, why am I doing this? Because I think when your students understand a little bit more about anatomy, about how music works, about how their ears work, about how the brain works, about how sine waves work, about how music is structured in the environment, it helps them to understand how to better use their instruments, their natural bodies, as well as the instruments they play, to make a more beautiful sound, and why music is important. It teaches things about ourselves and about life. And I also find that uh, many of you will be familiar with Carol Dweck's work on mindset, um, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Uh, short story is that fixed mindset is I have a certain trait and I cannot change it, like my height. There's not a lot I can do to make my height more. It is fixed. My um, my age, it's not a lot I can do to change my age. Growth mindset is that the thing that I am looking at is something that I can change, something I have an influence over. So we can approach music in that sense of we are naturally gifted singers, we are naturally gifted musicians, we are so talented, we are a fixed ability level that is high or that is low, but that is not changeable. Or we can approach it as a learning, growing process. And I've found that when you can explain some of the science and math behind how music works, it takes away some of the mystery. It doesn't take away the beauty. That is a worry that many people have. Um, one of my favorite uh, living, or not, not currently living, <laughs> former humans, um, uh, Richard Feynman, used to say that um, we, we often think that like understanding the biology, the, the anatomy, the chemistry, the, the molecular structure of a flower might take away that beauty. But the more deep you go into the science, you find more there. You, you get to see how wonderful and amazing and beautiful the world can be. Like the fact that we can breathe, that's amazing. Most planets don't have trees that make oxygen for us. That's incredible. We have billions of trees around the world just pumping oxygen in the air for us for free so that we can breathe. How wonderful is that? So amazing. Like it doesn't make me like trees less. It makes me like trees more. That's so cool. We got rid of all the trees. We couldn't breathe. That'd be awful. How cool is breathing? You think of it as being like a balloon, a sack that fills up with air. It's not. It's all these little tubes, these little, these little pathways that just get a little bit of air in them, and then it passes into your bloodstream and goes all through your body, and the oxygen gets delivered to all these different parts of your body. It's amazing how that works. It's so much cooler than just looking at this meat sack from the outside and thinking, wow, humans are cool. When you learn the science, it helps you to understand that there's a lot of beauty there, and it, it, it doesn't take away the magic, but it takes away the mystery. Because music seems like this very esoteric thing. It's a thing you have or you don't. A beautiful voice is something you have or you don't. A feel for phrasing, a talent on the violin, it's something you have or you don't. But it's not. It's not something you have or you don't. It's math. It's physics. It's science. And there's something, there's that 1%, that little shining cherry on top, that's hard to capture in the science, in the physics, in the math. That's the thing we often focus on. The little magic, the human element. You can have a pitch-perfect performance from a beautiful synth, 
amazing processors, top of the line computers, produce that music, but it's often missing something. If you listen back to some of those recordings from the 50s, the 60s, some of the stuff's out of tune. Sometimes the bass is a little bit behind the beat, but that adds something to it. It adds a little humanity to it. So some of that stuff is hard to quantify and put into the bucket of this, but 99% of what we do can be explained with math and physics and science. Now we're not gonna go that, that deep. I'm gonna go, here's where the students maybe is relevant. Here's where I might take you a little bit past that so that you have a deep enough understanding to explain to the students what's relevant to them. Here's where the actual science is. I'm not going down here. We're gonna keep that all up here where it's relevant to you guys and where it's understandable. So the main focus is gonna be on um, our, the way hearing works, how sound is translated from its production to its perception, into its translation in the brain and into being reproduced by our bodies, as well as the overtone series. Many of you may be familiar with the overtone series. We'll go a little bit deeper there. Hopefully, even if you are relatively familiar with that, I'm gonna start at the basic level. It may seem like a repetition for a lot of you, but hopefully give you some new insights that maybe you didn't realize before about how it impacts the shape of your vowels, the production of your voice, and how you can use it um, as a performer to enhance yourself. So go ahead and grab that Music Math in the Brain handout that I gave you there. Um, I generally don't like to use the, the handouts. I'm not, I'm not much of a PowerPoint guy because I like to be a little bit more improvisational and feel the energy of the room and go on interesting tangents that you guys seem to be responding to. Um, but we will spend a little bit more time in the handout during this session just because there's a lot of animation there that is relevant. Um, so feel free to keep that in your laps there and just sort of flip around as I reference things. We're gonna dive into the overtone series first. Um, so that first graphic is a little bit complex there, but the story I wanna tell you is about a guy named Pythagoras. Who remembers Pythagoras? Yeah, what's he most famous for? Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem. Who knows the Pythagorean theorem? Say it. There you go. Good. He was also a music theorist. He was very, very, um, he added a lot to the field of music theory, and he was one of the first ones to clearly articulate the overtone series and to develop uh, a complex system of tuning. There's a, there's a system of tuning pianos and, and keyboard instruments called Pythagorean tuning, named specifically after his strategy. We're not gonna go into the differences between different kinds of tunings today. It's a little esoteric for us, but know that he did that, and it's pretty cool. And there's a, co uh, a concept called the Pythagorean comma, which is the gap between a pure fifth and the fifth you hear on the piano. Because the piano has to have every interval slightly shrunken just a little bit so that you can play in every key without things sounding out of tune. When you play in pure intonation, if you're playing with an ensemble of, of winds or of strings or a group of singers, you can have those intervals slightly larger to be at their pure interval status instead of the slightly shrunken they have to be on the piano. That gap between what the ideal interval is mathematically and what it has to come out of, out of the piano as in order to function in all the different that gap is called the Pythagorean comma. But I want to paint a picture for you. Pythagoras, old dude, way long ago, coming out, playing music, singing music with his friends. They get a big old string and pluck it, and it goes. Bwah, you pluck the big string. He noticed that when he was looking at it, this is just like da Vinci, um, Pythagoras would pay careful attention to things. Da Vinci was known to buy birds. You would, you would just sell birds on the street back then. It was very weird. They would give you a cage, and here's a bird. And you would just open it up and the bird would fly away. And the guy would go, why did you just let go of the bird? You just, I just sold that to you. Why did you let you? He goes, oh, I'm just studying flight. I just wanted to see how it flapped its wings. Can I have another bird? No, you're just going to let it go. So he would watch them and then he would draw diagrams of every part of the motion to understand how the flight worked. Pythagoras noticed that when you see that large string vibrating, it's not just vibrating as one big string up and down. If you look carefully at a string instrument, guitar, inside a piano, a violin, cello, the larger the better, you'll see that it's vibrating its full length, but it's also vibrating at the halfway point. Vibrating there and vibrating there. It's also vibrating at the third. It's also vibrating at the fourth. That's what you're seeing in that first graphic there. Each of those vibrations is a mathematical fraction, an exponent of the original frequency, and that's where we build up our overtones. If you're not familiar with what an overtone is, a, a simple definition is that the pitch you are producing is called the fundamental. That's my fundamental. That's the pitch I am producing. If you produce up just the fundamental, you get a pure sine wave. That's that kind of like MIDI sound you get on, the, on a, a very, very cheap piano or on a, a synthesizer or on Audacity. If you just put in a pure sine wave, all you get is that pitch. The difference between and ah uh, and ooh and a violin playing that note and a flute playing that note is called timbre, which you're probably familiar with. 
timbre is defined by the relative strength of those overtones. That's the only difference in timbre. You cannot have any difference between a piano, a voice, a violin if you remove all the overtones and just have the fundamental. All you get is pitch. The thing that shapes the color of the sound is the relative strength of those overtones. That's why I'm focusing so much on that today, because it allows you to help your students understand why, scientifically, there's a difference between good sounds and bad sounds. If I say I like ah, uh, and I don't like ah, uh, the reason is because it's different overtones at different levels of strength. Now, they don't need to go that deep with your third graders, but understanding a little bit of this, and that it's not just magic, and it's not just weird sounds my teacher makes, but it's also <laughs> math and science, that can be really helpful for them in making them have to be a little bit more motivated for those kids for whom this is a relevant thing. Many of the kids aren't gonna care at all. You're not gonna convince every kid that acoustical science and overtone theory is gonna be relevant to them and, and interesting. But you have kids for whom it is interesting. I've done this sort of stuff with seven-year-olds before and had them fascinated the whole time. Not everyone, but for those kids for whom it is, it really does make a difference, especially as you get to those older levels. Seventh, eighth grade, they start thinking music's kind of an airy-fairy thing, and you start giving them a little bit more concrete understanding, they start connecting a lot more deeply. So Pythagoras noticed that if you pluck that string, you get that low note. Does that work? <laughs> it does, cool. Um, so I get that low note. And if you just hold the string at the halfway point, guitarist, violinist, you're familiar with finding the node at, the, at that exact fraction to get the higher pitch, you go to that halfway point, you get an octave. Cool, if I keep cutting it in half, here's one, here's a half, here's a quarter, here's an eighth, here's a sixteenth, here's a thirty-second, I can't really make a lot of beautiful music with just those notes. I mean, I can set a mood. There is a piece called in C, which is just C's, all the way to the piano, but there's only one. There's not a lot of them. So I can't do a lot with this, but he noticed, okay, so here's my one, here's my two, if I cut it to a third, ooh, I get a new note. This is exciting. Now I can do some new stuff. And if I take this one as my new one, and then go to the second and the third, here's my first octave, here's my second uh, overtone, my octave, there's my fifth. Oh, sorry, there's my sixth, there's my fifth. Um, and then you drop it down the octave to put them in the same range. Now I've got a lot of notes. I can drop that one down, now I can go a fifth up from this one. Now I've got a lot more notes. He built up the full scale from those fifths, and that's pure Pythagorean tuning, is pure exact intervals. If we say this bottom note is 100 vibrations per second, the hertz, the frequency of that note is 100 per second. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, it's between the flat, the flat seven and the six, and then 800, because eight is double of four, which is double of two, which is double of one. Every time you double, you get the octave. So, octave, fifth, octave, third, fifth again, because three is half of six. Flat seven, six-ish. The piano can't replicate the exact seventh overtone because, again, we had to shrink things a little bit to make all the different keys work. So when you're in that pure intonation, they're exact ratios to each other. You'll see that in the handout there. But the math all adds up. So when those strings are vibrating, they're vibrating at the full length, they're vibrating at the half, they're vibrating at the third, they're vibrating at the fourth, all the way down, all the way infinitesimally, probably stops somewhere around the 16th, 20th, 50th overtone, but depends on the length of the string and how hard you plucked it, I imagine. Um, also depends on the timbre of the instrument because different overtones are highlighted in different instruments. You can actually play, along, uh, play around with a few, uh, there are apps and uh, devices online, actually Jason would be a great guy to show you that. I bet Jason can do it from scratch, like <laughs> building up a timbre from the pure sine wave and adding the overtones to change the timbre. He, he's, a, he's a very intelligent guy on that end. Um, down at the bottom there, you have just those intervals so that you know how it all relates. Fundamental, first overtone gives you the octave, second gives you the fifth, third gives you the octave again, fourth gives you the third, then the fifth, then the kind of minor seventh, it's a little bit lower than minor seventh, but higher than major sixth, and then the tonic again. You can see on the next page, it goes a little bit further and more further extended. You see that as the overtones extend, they get closer and closer and closer. You start getting major seconds, and then minor seconds, and then even smaller than minor seconds. Something that is very, very um, interesting about this, the second one there just has the frequencies on there as well, so you can see the ratios. 
Uh, that third one there is something I've been researching for a very long time and I didn't have good data on it until just like a few days ago. So I threw this in there and I don't understand it fully yet, but it matches something I've felt intuitively for several years. And so I wanted to share it with you. And that is that every note contains all of those overtones. So if I play a C, it has a C, a C, an E, a G, a, a B flatish, a C, a D, an E, all the way are contained in that fundamental pitch. If you're playing a chord, when you play a major chord in a correct voicing, you have lowest octave, octave, fifth, octave, third, all of these notes are contained in the overtone series of the bottom note, so they sound very pleasing to the ear. Because those overtones are in your brain, even if you're not hearing them. If you're not hearing those higher pitches when I play the low pitch, they're still in your brain. If your brain knows the difference between, and, oh, uh, I can't sing a low C. <laughs> uh, if you can tell one of those is my voice and one of them is the piano, you're hearing overtones. That's all you're hearing that tells you the part of your brain that says one of those is the voice, one of those is the piano, that's overtones. That's timbre. So, you are not, you, you, you are not deaf to that. And the same, same idea when I, when I work with students who, um, who teachers or, or parents or whatever say might be tone deaf. If you can hear the difference between a statement and a question, then you're not tone deaf. If you can understand questions, that's only because the pitch goes up at the end. That's what makes it a question. If you answer the phone and you're not confused about whether it's a boy's voice or a girl's voice, you're not tone deaf. You're hearing the difference in the pitches. You're hearing the difference in the timbre. You just need more refined hearing to hear those subtle differences. But when we play a major chord in a full voicing, all of the notes you're hearing match up with the overtones your brain's already hearing. When you play a chord in a minor voice, your brain still hears that E natural from the fundamental, but it also hears the E flat from the piano. So in your brain, even if I'm not playing the dissonance, your brain is hearing that dissonance. So it was an explanation for me of why minor songs are sad, because there's more dissonance. Even when there's not dissonance, it's not a dissonant sound. Your brain is hearing that dissonance. If this is an in-tune, beautifully well-played, well-produced low C, those overtones of the major third will be there. And even if your audience knows none of this and isn't trained musicians, they are hearing that. So that's a really cool thing for me. The bottom of that uh, second page has uh, some examples of different intervals and their overtone stacks above them. So the bass clap is the two notes being played simultaneously. The treble clap is the overtones your brain is hearing as it's played you can see that more pure intervals, a two to one ratio, has less dissonance. As the ratios get more complex, three to two is a fifth, four to three is a fourth, five to four is a third, five to three, six to five, eight to five, nine to eight, as you get to whole steps, half steps, tritones, the dissonance increases, even if the objective dissonance of the interval isn't that bad. You say, like, oh, well, I like the sound of the major sixth. It's a nice sound. Yes, but your brain likes it less, because your brain likes simple math. When your brain hears, it's like, I don't have to do a lot of math. That's pretty nice. It's 100 and 200. Great. I can do that math nice and easy. When it hears, brain doesn't like that math. Too much math. Too complex. Do not like. We want it nice and simple. The other thing that's really cool about this is as you get into the frequencies and the hertz stuff with your students, you can help them understand why they have to be so careful about their vocal pitch. I talked in the last session about vocal health a lot, but I'll give you a quick uh, idea here. The vocal folds inside your throat, really small, about the size of thumbnails. They move really, really fast. They're really, really flexible. Can you shake, take your hand like this, please? Put it nice and flat. Can you move your hand about one time per second? One, 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 two times per second. One, two, one, two, three times. One, two, three, one, two, three, four times. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 220 times per second. <laughs> kind of hard, right? But your brain can do it without even knowing the numbers. Men in the room, please sing. Uh, uh, uh. Ladies in the room, please sing. Uh. Men, your chords are moving 220 times a second, approximately. I don't know if those pianos are dead in tune. And ladies, you're moving 440 times per second. You can't do that with your hands. You can't do that consciously. Your brain didn't even necessarily know that. Many of you probably know what A440 is. But you might not have known I was playing an A. Your brain can do that. It's really, really, really cool. I want you to flip the page and look at some of that uh, ear anatomy for a second here. <clears throat> Skip that next page, go to page five. When I produce a sound, there's a very interesting chain of events that happens. That pattern gets translated through multiple mediums. When I first touch this, 
Pretend this is a real piano. A hammer strikes a string. The string vibrates. The, the air inside the body of the piano vibrates. The body of the piano vibrates. The sound comes out into the air in the room, and the air in the room vibrates with the sound of the string, the air inside the piano, and the body of the piano. All of them are important parts of the sound. If I'm producing a sound to my body, it's not just the pure buzz of my vocal cords. The buzz of my vocal cords, if you cut off the top, they've done this with like chickens and ducks and stuff, they'll cut off their heads and then blow air through the vocal cord folds. It just sounds like an oboe reed. It's, just, it's just like a pure sine wave, like really aggressive sound. The, the instrument is this. This is the body of the instrument. You can change the shape to change the sound. And I can make a lot of different sounds with my voice because I can move around everything inside here in order to manipulate those overtones and change the sounds that are coming out of my mouth. So, you can do that with the body of an instrument too. This is gonna sound different than a grand piano. A grand will sound different than an upright. An upright will sound different than those small toy pianos you give to kids, because the bigger the body, the bigger the vibrations, the deeper, more resonant the sound. The more highlighted overtones you get from the larger strings and the larger body. And the more complex the overtones, the more rich and complex the sound you're getting. So I play that, string flux, air, body of instrument, air in the room. Air in the room vibrates against your ears. What's really cool is, you know how your ears are weirdly shaped? Do you ever think about that? Like why aren't ears just kind of like a little cup? Why are they all wrinkled and kind of weird shaped? A big reason for that is being able to place sounds geographically. Because of all the weird uh, wobbles and, and, and bumps and, and, and curves in my ears, I can tell exactly where someone in the room is just by sound. If I close my eyes, someone around in the room say, hi. Hi. Yeah, I can hear exactly where it is. Now somebody somewhere else in the room, Hi, you're not. Yeah, I know. I don't even open my eyes. Hi, you're not, right? I was right, right? The hi wasn't over there. The ka wasn't over there. I know where they are. If you just had ear holes, if you just had little cups, you wouldn't be able to tell that well where it is. And because of the weird shape, as the sound hits your ears, it's slightly different depending on where it comes from. I can show you this really viscerally right now. Set that hand out in your lap. And sing for me one more time. Let's, uh, let's do those waves. Uh, 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 Exactly the same, just as beautifully. Uh, Do it again, exactly the same. Memorize that sound, make exactly the same sound. Uh, Thank you. Cup your hands in front of your mouth and go up. Uh, stick your fingers in your ears. Uh, same exact sound, same exact sound. Cup your hands behind your ears, same exact sound. Uh, cup your hands backwards on your ears. Uh, backwards thing and just say, hello, my name is whatever your name is. Hello, hello my name is Jill. Do it over here. Hello, my name Isn't that a weird experience? I literally can't do this for more than a few seconds without my brain breaking. It sounds so strange to me. I've never heard this sound before. It's a very uncomfortable thing for my brain. I don't like it. As soon as I do this, it's totally fine. But if I do this, all my sound is coming from behind my head. And there's zero experience in my life where I produce a sound behind my own head. That doesn't happen. So my brain gets very, very confused. And I, I can feel my heart rate going up. And my skin, I, I guarantee you, I'm more sweaty than I was before. Like, all my stress responses are going off because my brain is going, something's weird. Your voice is coming from behind you. That's not a normal thing. Something is wrong here. So, so you can see that even when you're producing the same sound, you can change that sound by changing the acoustic. If you're singing in a, in a stone cathedral, if you're singing in a shower, if you're singing in outside, if you're singing inside this space, that changes the sound, even if the sound coming out of your mouth objectively is the exact same sound. Those little wrinkles in your ears help you to place the sound in place, in location, geographically. It's super cool. We didn't have to have those. Snakes don't have those. They have little holes on the side of their ear. They, they actually, I don't even know if they have holes. They just they hear it through bone conduction. But, but we have these weird shaped things that help us to place that in space. It's super cool. So, string flux, body vibrates, air vibrates, air vibrates into our ears, we're able to locate it physically, air vibrates against our eardrums, eardrums vibrate, eardrums vibrate against your cochlea, it's a little snail-shaped thingy, it's full of liquid, it's inside your ears. You may have heard of uh, people who are deaf getting cochlear implants, it is often a, a cochlea damage that is causing that, that hearing problem. The cochlea is full of liquid, so the air Vibrates, hits the eardrum, vibrates, hits the cochlea, vibrates, liquid inside the cochlea, vibrates. There's these little hairs inside the cochlea that are of varying lengths and thicknesses that then when that vibration happens, they vibrate sympathetically with the frequency. So a frequency of A440, oh, that's not an A. Oh, oh. There are specific hairs just for that A440. 
And there are ones for 435, and there are ones for 432, and they're all the way down and all the way up to the full range of human hearing, which is relatively limited, actually, compared to dogs, cats. There's a lot of sounds that you can't hear. Very interestingly, if a tiger roars, there are subtones at the bottom of the tiger's uh, roar that are not uh, audible to humans. You can't hear the fundamental pitch of a tiger's roar. They've actually, in several movies, taken all the overtones and all the higher tones that you can hear out of the sound and just kept that pure fundamental that is below our perception and put it into the soundtrack of horror movies and it triggers your anxiety like nothing else. Just like the, the, that feeling sometimes you get in a movie where you're just like, you know, the strings start playing and you feel this uh, Sometimes it's the dissonance in the strings, it's the dissonance in the overtones, the stuff I was talking to you there, but sometimes they sneak in some really low pitches you can't even hear, but your body perceives it. You feel that vibration. It's a touch thing more than a hearing thing. The hearing part of the brain doesn't perceive it, but you feel that terror inside your soul. Same thing with those high pitches. You can blow a, a dog whistle and your, your dog will start yipping like crazy. You're, that's still affecting you. I don't know if any of you have ever woken up in the middle of the night and heard like a whine coming from some of your electronics somewhere, just that high pitch kind of squeal. Yeah, yeah, so you don't always notice that because your brain will quickly tune it out if it's consistent because it's just one or two little hairs that are picking up on that perception. Once it's been there for 20 minutes, an hour, it just kind of turns off. And you notice that, like, you don't notice the hum of your refrigerator. <coughs> or the, yeah, the sound of your AC. We're all silent for two seconds. There's a lot of sounds in this room that we weren't hearing a second ago. Some wines over there. Computer's running. Computer's running. Yeah. Yeah, we get used to it. We attenuate to that. And one of the things that's very interesting is as you get older, the smaller, thinner hairs that respond to the higher frequencies start to die. And that's why as you get older, I don't know if you've seen this, the, the teenager's texting tone yeah. thing, mm -hmm. things that adults can't hear, you played with that before, hearing loss, hearing damage, that can affect that too. The thing that's really interesting is it happens faster for males than it does for females. And female voices are higher pitched. So scientifically, when your dad, your grandpa kind of ignores his wife sometimes, <laughs> you might not be able to hear it. Like those hairs <laughs> might have died. You might not be, just not be hearing those high pitches anymore. It starts to fade as time goes on. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. So that's, that goes to the cochlea. So we get clutch string, body of the instrument, air in the room, vibration into our ears, eardrum, cochlea, liquid, strings, little hairs. Then that sends an electrical signal to the brain. So we've now translated it from originally a sound signal to airwaves into vibration in our body. So movement instead of, wa instead of sound, instead of airwaves. Now into electricity. Electricity firing in the brain. If you scan the brain while you're listening, I will see... I will see electrons firing. I will see, see the electrical signal in your neurons firing exactly 440 times per second for that pitch. The exact frequency of the string vibrating is the exact frequency of the electrical signal in your brain. So if I don't know what pitch you're listening to, but I scan your brain, I can say she's listening to A440 right now by the scan of the brain. It's very expensive to do those scans, so you probably wouldn't be able to do it yourself. But it's cool. And that signal manifests that sound in your head. You can send that electrical signal down here to your vocal folds and to your lungs, and then reproduce that pitch. Everyone sing that pitch, Shereen. Beautiful. You don't need to know math. You don't need to know the numbers. Your brain balances the tension in your vocal folds with the air pressure from your lungs to produce exactly 440. Exactly. And if you're a little hair under, if you're 437, it's terrible. Because, because why? Go back to the first page. Go back to the first page. Two to one ratio, brain's happy. Three, two to three ratio, brain's happy. Four to five ratio, brain's happy. 437 to 440 ratio, brain's not very happy. That's why out of tune notes sound so bad. They're so much worse than just a dissonant interval. A dissonant interval like a tritone. It's a very pleasant tritone. I'll, I'll try harder on the next try. Um, so, that is dissonant, but it's something like a 7 to 12 ratio or whatever. The numbers are over there. I'm not there on my head. But it's, it's single digit numbers. 437 to 440 is a really complex fraction. Your brain doesn't like it. When you're just slightly out of tune, it's actually worse than being a little bit more out of tune. Because if it was 420 to 440, at least that, like, you can simplify that ratio. You can have 210 to 220. You can have one, one, 105 to, yeah, 105 to 110. So you keep going down. Like, you make that ratio pretty small. 437 to 440, pretty awful. Really terrible. If you looked at those sine waves on a chart, instead of lining up, instead of one sine wave with one that's going twice as fast, 
and matches up every two reads, you get one that is completely erratic. It looks like scribbles on the page if you're very, very close, especially the higher you go. This is why a bad soprano sounds so much worse than a bad bass or a bad baritone or a bad alto. As soon as you go higher, those frequencies are much more complex. If you're singing a high soprano A, that's 880. If you're singing above that A, you might be doing 1,000 times per second. If you have 1,005 to 1,006 ratio, your brain does not like that. It's very bad. It's bad sounds. So this is one of those things that in a small way, understanding, okay, every time I sing, my chords are vibrating a certain time, a certain amount of time per second, a certain number of times. And if it's slightly off from my neighbor, it sounds way worse. So I need to be very detail-oriented because I can't move my hand 220 times a second, but I can move my vocal cords 220 times a second. I don't need to know the numbers, but my brain needs to be focused. I can't be distracted by other things going on in the room because there's a lot of processing power going on there to figure out what that ratio is. And if I'm trying to do it from solfege, now that becomes even more complicated because if you hear the pitch, sing that pitch for me. Great, Ben, can you sing up the octave, please? Sing that pitch. Thank you, the ladies, you're in this pitch, this pitch, thank you. Thank you, unison, beautiful. If you can't sing in that octave, that's fine, just don't sing. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, now, ladies, ladies, can you sing up a fifth, please? This is one, can you sing five? Ready? So what you did, what you did was, vibration, Vibration in the air, vibration in the eardrums, vibration in the cochlea, vibration in the strings, electrical signal in the brain, but not sending that electrical signal to the vocal folds, taking that electrical signal and saying, I need to take that number, whatever that number is, I believe that's a 256 uh, middle C, and I need to do a two to three ratio of that number. So that would be 125, 128, I believe. 384, so your brain had to do that. That took me four seconds. It doesn't take me four seconds to sing a fifth. But my brain can do that math even though I can't do it consciously that fast. You don't just need to hear the pitch. You can create it in your head by doing that math subconsciously. How cool is that? And our kids are doing that. They're doing complex differential calculus in their brains before they've even heard the word calculus. It's super neat. And then you send that signal down here and balance that with the rest support and you can produce that beautiful sound. And the balance, the blend, the beauty we get in our tone, the connection we get in the ensemble comes from those numbers being exactly perfect. It has to be exactly perfect. If you have a circle and you have pi as part of your, part of your circumference and instead of pi you use 3.13, you're gonna have an ugly circle. It's gonna be really gross. It has to be exactly pi. You say, well, I'll just use 3.14 and round it off. No, it's an ugly circle. It's only beautiful if it's pi. It has to be exactly correct. The beautiful A is only beautiful if it's 440 and 440. If it's 440.2 times per second, it's bad. It needs to be perfect. That's why we have to hold them to such a high standard because in every other class, a 98% is amazing. A 98% is an A plus. Great job, science, math, amazing. 98% right in music, all your notes are 98% of the way in tune. You, you're flat, you're sharp, you're, you're gross. You're an awful ensemble. If every single note, if every single note is 98% in tune, you have the worst choir that anyone's ever heard in their life. I don't know if I've ever heard a choir that didn't sing at least one note in tune the whole concert. It's insane. 98% is not enough. It's not perfect. And rhythm ties into it too. Because the second that you're a little bit behind, or you're a little bit ahead in the rhythm, if you're a little bit behind or a little bit ahead, now the overtones are off. Now the intonation isn't locked in. Now you're singing a different frequency than your neighbor for just that little half second. It throws everybody off and you start readjusting. And everything's off for the rest of the time. A lot of problems in intonation are problems in rhythm because everything is not locked in exactly perfectly. It needs to be perfect every time. I have a few examples to show you of things such as that. But first, I want to show you that overtone vowel chart on that page we skipped. That's why I don't do slides, because then I skip around too much. Page four. Page four. So this is an example. This is an example of an um vowel. This is what the frequencies look like. Every vowel has a different ratio of overtones and frequencies. As you're singing, not only are you doing all that complex math to figure out all the intervals, every time you change vowel, every time you change sound, you're changing which overtones you're highlighting. You're doing amazing work. When, for me to speak this sentence should be impossible. 
It's crazy the amount of effort that needs to go into changing my mouth shape to manipulate the overtones that dramatically for every different vowel. Just to go e a o that fast is insane. It's crazy that our brains can do that. There's amazing things our bodies can do. The fact that we can walk is amazing. It took forever to teach robots how to walk. It's so hard to walk. You don't know how to walk. Your body knows how to walk. If you try to explain to someone how you walk, tighten up this muscle and relax this muscle and lift this up and then you lean your right forward and then you land on there and then this knee bends and then this knee lifts up and then this one goes here and your shoulders have to stay back because if you lean too far forward, you couldn't explain it. There's no way. There's no way. But we just figure it out because our brains are that smart. They can figure this stuff out. But when you understand that there's science to it, it's not magic. It's not magic that some people can sing. It's science. Some people need a lot more effort to develop that skill because some of us had our parents singing to us every single day. Some of us sang along with Disney songs and musicals in the car all the time. Some of us sang along with musical shows and movies and Miss Rogers and all these other kind of media. Some of them had nothing. Some kids have literally never heard a beautiful singing tone before they entered your classroom. They're really far behind. If you're an English teacher and a kid came in and they'd never heard English before and you had another child who was fluently speaking English for six years, it would be very difficult to teach both of them at the same time. We have the most differentiated classrooms in the school. I have students in high school choirs, I have students that have had lessons longer than I have, and I have students that have never sung before they walk into my room. I've also taught math. I've never taught a math class where I have some kids doing AP Calc and some kids that can't add. That doesn't happen, but it happens in our classrooms. So understanding that it's a process, it's science, it's physics, it's anatomy, it's biology. Understanding this for yourself, even if you can't use any of the words, even if none of this sticks in the brain, just understanding that concept and being able to articulate to your students that it's something that they can develop helps them to break that fixed mindset and move into that growth mindset and understand it's a process, I can learn it. When you get a vocabulary book for the first time in a language, like, oh, all the, all the words, they're all in here. This is great, I, I can just read this and learn all the words. I don't have to learn all the words by just talking to people in French for 12 years. That's way too hard, I can never learn it that way. But I can just, oh, there's all, they're all here. I mean, I can learn, I can have conversations, I can watch videos, like I'll pick it up somewhere, but there's, there's not, it's not an infinite number of words. There's, there's a book with all the words in it, that's great. All the notes, they're right there. All the notes, they're on the page. All the frequencies, they're there. We can scan it, you don't need to know it. But knowing that it's possible to know it if you wanted to. Hey, you're gonna have some kids who wanna dive deep. I had some really interesting things with, with uh, I had this one kid who, so fascinating, he, um, he came in and made this amazing connection, which I still have not researched enough to understand fully, but when you have beautiful intervals, they're good ratios, right? You, saw, you talked about how an octave is two to one, two to three, three to four, we talked about that. He asked, he said, Mr. Keene, I learned in science class that light has frequencies too. Do you, do you know if colors that look good together, do they have a pleasing ratio of their frequencies too? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm like, whoa, what a cool idea, dude. I, when I searched everywhere, I could not find any research on that topic. So I, it could, because the hard thing is um, light, light frequencies have ranges. There's a lot of variety in color, so like there's a wide range, and also the frequency is much, much higher. It's thousands and millions of times per second, not, not individual hundreds of times per second, like sound. It moves much faster, so the range is much more difficult finding. But it seems in general, if you match the frequency ranges to the color wheel, complementary colors, in general, are a one to two or a two to three ratio of their frequencies, around approximately. How cool, that's something I'll go into much deeper at some point in my life, maybe a PhD, but what a cool idea. And sometimes it sparks something in a kid and they want to go and learn that. They start producing their own music, they start researching things, they start building a synth or building an app or doing something cool. Giving them that opportunity is really, really great. Because we're great at capturing the kids who love music. We're great at getting the kids who love to sing, who love to play, who love to write music, who love to explore the arts. But those kids that don't, those kids that are a little bit more academically minded, a little bit more Passionless, boring, whatever you want to call them. Those kids that are a little bit more academic in nature. I mean, you know, we're, we're all musicians. We like the music kids, sure. But you can capture those kids who aren't the music kids too if you tie in these other subjects. We can go into poetry, we can go into dance, we can go into a hundred other things. Uh, we, can, we can tie it across the curriculum. Today, it's math and the brain, so I'm not going to go too deep in all that other stuff. But um, the chart at the bottom below that vowel shows you the different parts of your instrument that you can manipulate to adjust those sounds. I want you to do a couple <coughs> of vowels with me. Can you set your... Uh, handouts in your lap or on the floor. Either octave is fine this time, gents. Um, let's, let's take a little lower, actually. Let's just stay there. That's fine. Uh, uh, thank you. Repeat after me. E-A-A. And 
this time, I want you to pay attention to every part of your instrument, your throat, your soft palate, the back of your tongue, the middle of your tongue, the front of your tongue, your teeth, your jaw, your lips, your cheeks. Pay attention to every part of your mouth as you sing, and tell me what's moving. E -A -R. E -A -R. Who noticed the motion? Raise your hands. What'd you see? What'd you feel? Sorry. Um, definitely tongue, definitely jaw. Yep. So what happened with the tongue? What happened with the tongue? Um, it goes, goes down with the vowel. Goes down with the vowel. E. Everybody sing with me and show me your hands. We have a nice hump tongue. E. A. A. The tongue drops. Try lifting your tongue on an A. A. Hard, right? <laughs> Try dropping your tongue on an E. <laughs> kind of hard, right? Yeah, so we're manipulating the overtones when we do that. That's what we're doing. We're shaping those overtones. The difference between E and E is overtones. That's all it is. And you can physically manipulate that. Mostly those first two, E, A, they're tongue vowels. We get to A, which is a neutral in the middle. A, O, U. Everyone sing with me. A, O, U. Close your eyes. Pay attention to every part of your instrument. Mostly lips. What happened with the tongue? Did anything happen with the tongue? Not really. Try one more time. Oh. Almost nothing with the tongue, right? Tongue's out of there. Tongue is for E and A. It gets that brightness in the vowel. E, A are bright vowels, right? O, U are dark vowels. Yeah, we're familiar with that from our choir times, yeah? So dark vowel shaped with the lips, bright vowel shaped with the tongue. How interesting. I can use that in rehearsal. Hmm. Do it all the way through. E, A, O, U, tongue, tongue, neutral, lips, lips. You need that aw space to keep the organ <coughs> beautiful. Try it without that aw space. Sing e. e. Keep everything the same and just change your lips and your tongue to make an oo. So if you sing, ooh, they'll go, ooh. And if you sing, uh, they'll go, uh. <laughs> So decide, do you want ooh or ill? What do you want? And then we sing. It's, that's a nice one. I like that one a lot. So yes, vowel shapes created, overtones, manipulating the instrument, all of that stuff. I want to show you something really, really neat and cool right now. Um, how many are familiar with overtone singing? Who's heard of overtone singing before throat singing? Anybody who feels comfortable doing it? Oh, oh. can you do it? <laughs> really? Uh, I'm gonna show you, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you one of the best people in the world doing it, but I wanna show you me first so you don't compare me to her. <laughs> so I'm gonna try, and I, I'm not very good at it, but I have friends who are amazing and can actually manipulate the pitches and, and make melodies with the overtones. Um, so what you're gonna be listening for is the octave, third, fifth, second above my fundamental tone. It might take me a second to find the place. If you close your eyes, it's helpful. You're listening for high whistle tones above my fundamental pitch. Let me just find a comfortable middle place. something now, which is this amazing woman I found in college, and she's still doing it, um, killing it, and overtone singing it.
have that um, in your handouts there. You can watch the rest of the stuff. She has amazing stuff online. She's spectacular. Can I get that off as well? Thank you so much. One last thing I want to tell you about that's super helpful for my students, and this is something that I think might be the most practical tip, which is why I wanted to give it to you at the very end. So flip to that next page before the resources. It has the cochlea in there. A little bit more detail. There's a little cool muscle in the body called the stapedius. This is one of my favorite things, and I've almost never heard anyone else reference it aside from like actual ear doctors. Um, but I reference it in rehearsal all the time because the stapedius is a wonderful, amazing tool. And here's why it's so cool. I'm loud, right? I'm talking very loud right now. This is how far away my mouth is from my ear. Jason, if I was this close to your ear, would you want me to talk this loud right now? <laughs> Probably not, right? But it doesn't hurt my ears. It would hurt his ears. It would hurt your ears if I was right up in your face, but I'm not. I'm not in your face. It doesn't hurt you that bad when I'm this far away, but it doesn't hurt me. It doesn't hurt me. Isn't that weird? My ears are really close to my mouth. Why doesn't it hurt me? Partially, direction of the sound. It's going this way, spreading out. But the other reason is we evolved this little teeny muscle in our ears called the stapedius that dampens the eardrum whenever our vocal cords are producing sound. Imagine you're a monkey in a tree. You're hanging out with your other monkey friends, eating an apple. You see a tiger. Oh no, a tiger's coming. You have a specific part of your brain that produces sounds that say, there's a tiger. There's three separate sounds they have. They have, there's a tiger, which means get away from the tiger. <laughs> there's a snake, which means get out of the trees, because they can get you in the snakes, the, the trees, and you can stomp on the, on the ground. And they, they, have a, they have, there's an eagle. So there's different responses to the snake, the tiger, the eagle, because you might want to be higher, you might want to be lower, you might want to run away. There's different things you might want to do. They have three distinct calls there. They all come from the same part of the brain, which is separate from the part of their brain that handles general communication, loving sounds, whatever. It's actually the same part of the brain that's affected by Tourette's. And that's why they curse when you have Tourette's. Because it's the part of your brain responsible for cursing. You actually can't control that. It's subconscious. It's an automatic response to threat detection. So a lot of times when your students curse, they, they, I mean, you can learn you know, socialization, and we try not to curse in public. It's very hard to make it 30, 40 years in public teaching without accidentally having let one slip once. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Yeah, it's because it's not coming from the language part of the brain. It's coming from a core part of the brain that's saying, oh my god, there's a snake and it's about to eat me. That's what that means when you shout that, those words that I'm not going to say. That's what it means. But when you produce a sound, that stapedius activates because if you're screaming, ah, there's a tiger, you don't want to go deaf from your own screams because you got to hear the tiger. you got to run away from the tiger. So it helps to be able to protect your hearing when you're making loud sounds. But when you're making a sound, you can't hear me because you're dampening your ears. You can hear me, but not as well. So when I say don't talk while I'm talking, it's biology. You literally can't hear me. Oh, but I can still hear you. Sorry, here's the chart. There's the muscle. You can't do it. Don't tell me you can. You're lying. You can hear me, but not as well. Can't understand me as well. What's really cool, look at the bottom chart there, the last chart on that last page. What's really cool, that is the activation of the stapedius compared with the activation of the vocal folds. The stapedius activates first. It activates in preparation. As you prepare to turn on the vocal folds, stapedius vocal folds. First, hearing protection. So you don't want to not turn on your hearing protection a half second after you start screaming. That's not very good hearing protection, right? So the second they're thinking about talking, they've already turned off their ears. If you're considering talking, if you turn to a neighbor and go, that little ears off. You can still hear, not as well, not as well. So it's also tied into vocal technique. Because while you're singing, you can't accurately assess yourself that well. So your students will tell you, like, oh, I think that didn't sound good. Oh, I didn't like this. Oh, I didn't. They don't know. Play them recordings. Tell them what you're hearing from outside. Pull your students out of the ensemble to go to the back and listen. They can't hear. A, because when you're in the middle of all that sound, it's way too much sound. You can't decipher all that sound around your body. But B, because you're literally turning your ears off while you're using your vocal folds. So as soon as you turn that off, you can hear a lot better. You can bring them out, they can hear the full sound of the ensemble. The same thing is true for you. If you're constantly singing and talking while your ensemble is performing, you're not hearing them as well as you could. You're not able to assess their intonation, their vowel shifts, the subtle differences in the 17th overtone that is causing that out of tune singing. You can't hear those things. And when your singers are singing in slightly different vowels, can I get this half of the room to sing, ah, ah, yeah, whatever octave's comfortable, can I get this half of the room to sing, ah, ah, thank you, together. <laughs> Sounds out of tune. 
not. Overtones are added to. Remember that first page, the dissonances? You can also have that even on the same fundamental if you're singing different vowels, which means it's much harder to lock in your blend if your choir is singing polyphonic music where they're singing different syllables at the same time. If you're doing a simple arrangement that maybe has some loo -loo loos la la las in the background, and then they land on a nice chord at the end, you should try and change that to make sure they're all in the same vowel because the intonation is going to be better, the blend is going to be better. The more work you do on vowel work, the more beautiful that intonation will be. Often when you think they're flat, they're not flat. It's a vowel issue. And that only makes sense when you understand that vowels are overtones. That's how those things connect. That's how the math, the brain, the hearing, all of this connects in to every little detailed thing we do with our students. Pitch matching, vowel, blend, tone, ah, uh, registration. Oh, ah, uh, overtones, all the way through. You can show that on the piano. You can show it to your students. You can show that video. It'll blow their minds. You can practice it a little. We can all practice together for a second. It's the word rear. If you try to say the word rear and then constantly move between those sounds, rear, 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 play around with your lips in your mouth, see what you can hear inside your head. Let's all try it together. Find a low place in your voice. Rear, rear. I hear a few over here. Yeah? A few people felt it? Yeah? You can play with that at home. That's the only way I, I didn't have anyone show me anything. I just, someone once told me the weird thing. That's it. And I played with it. I played with it for four or five years before I could do what I showed you just now, and that's terrible compared to people who are really good. But you can play with that, and it can blow your kids' minds. And then you can show them that. And then you can show them a little bit of the science, and then you can maybe have your admin and your principal come in when you're doing the science and the physics lesson, and they go, wow, music isn't just singing silly folk songs, huh? This guy's talking about calculus and sine waves. How interesting. And that helps. That helps. So I hope that you've gotten a few things from this session that have been useful and interesting. I've tried to make sure that you've got some bite-sized nuggets, but also the broader philosophy there. Like I said, this is a deep topic. You can go for hours and hours for a full year and not scratch the surface. There are recordings of all of this online. Please follow up with me. Send me emails if you want more resources. There's videos out there. There's lots of material. There's a lot more stuff I wanted to show you that I didn't get to, but I would love to eventually. So I'd love to come back here and talk to you guys again. I'd love to do more work with you.